And this is essentially, essentially the, the third phase of AI, uh, and which really started about 10 years ago and completely revolutionized and changed the story of what we call artificial intelligence. And so, you know, if it started from in the 50s and 60s with uh, logic-based systems motivated by uh, Turing mostly, and then moved in the 80s to what we call statistical learning theory, and physical learning, which is essentially co-fitting uh, and using statistical models, uh, something very bizarre happened, or very surprising happened about 10 years ago uh, when uh, models, which are essentially deep neural networks, and that's really the only connection to networks that uh, I'm going here to have here, uh, which means many, many layers of, uh, of um, neurons, which are essentially just linear threshold functions like this, uh, essentially dot products with adjustable weights and that go through some sort of nonlinearity and connected with many, many layers, essentially change the, the picture of AI from uh, being a, a rather pathetic failure to, to something which seemed to work everywhere, especially in, uh, in, uh, in things like object recognition and vision, uh, speech recognition, uh, uh, control. Uh, they, they start driving cars, they do uh, uh, drug design, they do many, many other things. Essentially, many, many hard problems are now attacked by this type of networks where the, the input layer is essentially uh, just, you know, a big uh, pattern like pixels of an image and the output is something like, uh, who is it or uh, what is it talking about and so on. And nothing in between uh, except some tricks with the architecture really tell us how, how to, what we use to, to call feature extractions or, or, or all sorts of tricks and tweaks of AI and pattern recognition are simply all done by this type of fully connected or, or all sorts of convolution neural networks and so on. So I'm not going to get into this too much. Uh, the, the reason I, I guess I was invited here is because uh, we begin to have some sort of uh, theory. So of course the, the whole thing why deep neural network works so well is, uh, is because um, I mean, nobody really knows. I mean, it's, it's kind of... Anyway, so, uh, um, so deep neural networks uh, was really a big puzzle uh, and still is a big puzzle theoretically. I mean, what's going on here? I mean, these are very stupid machines. I mean, they, they just have these repeated patterns of, of, of neurons which are doing essentially the same thing. None of them is very smart. It's just a linear social function. But they somehow seem to capture in a very elegant way, in a very efficient way, uh, a lot of data, I mean, so this, uh, and, 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 uh, and a very complex uh, pattern recognition problem. It's not everything in AI, but it's, it's quite a lot of uh, impressive, uh, impressive problems. So uh, those who know, you, who know me, uh, uh, I'm actually coming from statistical physics, and, and, uh, and uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, information th theoretically inspired, uh, inspired uh, learning theory. Yes? It's not clear that the, the machines are dumb. I think you know, they are pretty powerful from uh, just because they, they can capture a lot of computation. The question is why their le learning is easy for them, right? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the simple question is why, do, why these machines perform so well, uh, despite the fact that they are very large in terms of number of parameters. So they seem to violate everything we believe we know about learning theory. So that's, that's essentially what I'm going to concentrate on. And uh, so, as I said, I mean, this is not the slide that I wanted to show you, but uh, so I'm going to skim a little bit through it. So, so essentially, the basic question is, uh, is it more than just multidimensional curve fitting? I mean, so, so you know, uh, curve fitting is uh, essentially this type of, uh, of a problem that every physicist knows from the first uh, lab in physics. And, Sometimes computer scientists also see data, which is very rare, but, but when they see data, <laughs> they may know that data actually have noise, and, and when you try to fit functions through data, you always have a problem of either, either, either fitting a, a too simple function, like this linear function, or, or, or too complicated functions, which can be, in this case, uh, almost an interpolation polynomial, but then uh, your function is going to go wild between the data points and it's not going to generalize well. So we all know, at least since the 80s, that the issue is not fitting the data, but what we call generalization. I mean, being able to fit, uh, to predict points outside of your data. So the main issue is generalization. 
And essentially, the question is how to avoid overfitting, which means how to avoid uh, too many, too complicated functions for your data. And uh, essentially, all of learning theory without, uh, without reducing, it, reducing it too much is, is all sorts of tweaks and tricks of, of these two things. I mean, give me generalization bounds, which means bound the error outside of your training data, giving the, the error inside your training data. And, uh, and uh, how to control the complexity or avoid overfitting of your classes in some clever way. And uh, there are many books about it, but that's it. Now, uh, is it really more than that? I mean, so, so Gauss already knew how to do everything and um, with least square <laughs> and so on. And, uh, and uh, the question is really, is this third phase of, 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 of learning theory, which is deep learning, doing more than care fitting? I argue it does. Not, not everybody agrees with me, but it's all right. So one of the features of deep learning is that it seems to, to improve with data. I mean, in some, in some strange way. I mean, usually when you have finite parameter, parameter class of functions, let's say polynomials of some finite degree or, or whatever, then eventually, they, they saturate. I mean, you don't, you don't get an improvement in performance when you add more and more points. Because uh, you, you, they're not, they're not going to estimate them better, maybe the parameters, but they're not going to really improve the performance. Deep, deep neural networks seem to improve performance with data, and that's why they go well with what we call big data. I mean, essentially, you give them more data points, they, they generally really profoundly improve their performance. And, um, so something else is going on there, which is not just fitting the data. And uh, again, I, I'm going to skim through these, uh, all these uh, results. Essentially what we do, what I do with two of my students, Noga Zoslavsky and, and, uh, and, Ziv, and Ravid Ziv, and actually a few others, I mean Shlomi Agmon and, and Amichai Pensky, which would have been mentioned here, um, uh, is essentially made out of three different types of theories or components which we really need to bring together in order to see what's going on. The first time, the first is what I wanted to talk about here, which is this really rethinking statistical learning theory, which is just in, in one sentence, forget about all those worst case pack bounds, uh, which uh, some of you may know, I mean, uh, which essentially is supposed to control my generalization in a distribution independent way for the worst case type of data, I mean, and with some probability, okay. So uh, for typical samples. Uh, this doesn't seem to give anything for such networks. I mean, the bounds that you get for any reasonable estimation, estimate of the dimensionality of the weights uh, don't seem to, to uh, uh, are null. I mean, the, you get probabilities, uh, things like probabilities less than a million or something. That's not very interesting. Now, uh, on, uh, on the other hand, if you forget about hypothesis classes almost altogether, forget about the type of functions you're trying to learn, which is because this is way too rich. But think about the, 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 the dynamics of the training. I mean, what, what actually happens there that somehow self-regulate the learning and actually self-regulate the class, you can actually improve the bounds dramatically by moving from the hypothesis class concept to what I call the data dependent or the data compression bounds, which are essentially nothing more than sampling theorems. I mean, is there is some sort of an extension of you know, Nyquist uh, sampling, which is, sample your, your patterns cleverly enough, and then cluster. Cluster around, which is really a very old idea, but if you, if you use these bounds correctly, you really get a much, much more powerful bounds. The other, the other thing that happens to learning theory between the 80s and the 2000s is that we moved from small size problems, I mean hundreds of pixels in image, to very large size problems, millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of objects in uh, pixels or, or, or samples in, of speech or whatever it is. And, and uh, this is already a completely different game. We can already talk about, we care only about the typical patterns or, or care only about the typical uh, pieces of speech or care only about typical molecules or whatever. Which means I'm going, we already have what we call concentration very sharp concentration of, of quantities around the, their means in these large end limits. And what we call the typical type theories, like statistical mechanics or like information theory, is really the game you have to play. So forget about worst case, think about typical case. And, 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 uh, and this is actually going to be characterized by mutual information, very much like information theory. So we're having something which begins to look like a coding theorems, but it's not coding at all, it's learning theory. But 
information theory alone cannot, cannot uh, tell you the real st story. It turns out that the real story is dynamics. I mean, something in this gradient descent algorithm, which I didn't even mention, but the fact that we, ac we actually train those networks by very stupid stochastic gradient descent methods, just minimize the error on the training data uh, in, with small, small adjustment or small changes in the parameters, which are the weights of these networks, with some noise, with some noise which is actually data dependent, which depends on, on, the, on, the, on the, because they're using stochastic gradient, which is just on part of the data and not all the data. I just hope that all of you know something about it. So because we're using stochastic gradient descent, in, in a very stupid-like way, it turns out actually to be very clever, and something very nice happened, there's some sort of conspiracy between the way the stochastic gradients and converge to, to, to local minima and, and the, this notion of forgetting or reducing the complexity of the problem by forgetting the irrelevant dimensions and essentially simplifying the, the, the hypothesis class. And I argue, and not only that, I mean, when you understand this, I'll give you a, the, the final result of my talk, is some sort of theorem that tells you that the time of convergence to a good solution actually goes down with the number of layers. More layers converge faster. And uh, it actually goes in a very regular way, like a power law, where the exponent of this power law can be predicted from the dynamical properties of the stochastic gradient descent. OK, so that's uh, essentially the outline. And uh, I'm going to skip many of the criticisms and things like this, and because you are a very smart audience, I'm just going to go through it very quickly. I apologize to add you saw some of it before. <laughs> so uh, essentially, the trick is, or the main trick of my, of my talk is to, of, my, of the, our work, is to think about the neural network. So think about X here as the input layer, pixels of an image. <laughs> So this is really a high-dimensional, high-entropy random variable with a lot of connections and, 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 and statistical correlations. But think about all the possible images that I have in mind. So this x is a huge, a huge dimensional vi variable which has a high entropy. And usually what we have is some label which I call here y, which can be just one bit. I mean, is it my picture or not my picture, or something like this? Is it a dog or not a dog? Or, or I don't know, some, some very simple alternative choices. So in binary, it can, of course, be more complicated, like speech recognition or whatever. But this Y, is, in the typical application of the neural network, is a lot simpler than X. And what, I, what exists, of course, I don't usually have it, is a joint distribution of X and Y, which I call the rule. Now, joint distribution of x and y, which means that there is some distribution over x, and there is some distribution of y given x, which is usually not deterministic, despite the fact that we like to think about it. I mean, the, if, I, if I ask for the same, for many of those patterns are shown to different people, they not always agree. So there's maybe a slight stochasticity in this rule, and I don't care about it. Now, usually what we call data or sample is some sort of a finite sample from this distribution. And that's what I'm going to call, to call the sampling, the sample, the training sample. But now what the network is doing, so this is completely outside of the network. I mean, the whole process of sampling the world doesn't depend on the representation of the network. Now, each one of the hidden layers, this cascade of layers that happens in deep learning, H1, H2, and later on, I'm going to call them, call them T1 up to Tm, and M can be very large. It goes out now to thousands and sometimes 10,000 layers. Nobody really understands why you need them. Essentially, what they generate, I mean, so we train them, as I say, by some sort of cycling through epochs of training. We cycle the examples through the through network and, and adjust the, the parameters by some sort of stochastic gradient descent. But once we fix the, the weights, I mean, those connections between the layers, each, the layers form a Markov chain. I mean, for, a, for so fixed, a fixed network, I present x, and then h1 depends only on x, h2 depends only on h1, and so on and so forth. So this is a Markov chain representation, which are all representation of my input pattern. And eventually, the last hidden layer, HM in this case, is going to generate a simple prediction of Y, which I call here Y hat. Of course, Y hat is not exactly Y, because, uh, because uh, the network may not be perfect, especially when I think about it as a probabilistic prediction. So essentially, what it gives me is the probability of the label Y 
given the path in X, and that's what we usually do. I mean, we, even if we have a deterministic network, if it's trained, usually what we do in the last layer, we put some sort of sigmoidal function or something and interpret it as a probability of the label. So, so this, we, I can easily think of Y as a probability of the label, Y hat as a probability of Y. What I call the desired label is Y, and the actual label I call Y hat. Okay, so now the real interesting question is, what is the dynamics of those layers when we train the network by backpropagation? I guess I don't know, have to tell anybody here what is uh, cross entropy or KL divergences uh, and what are mutual information, but this is not exactly your usual type of thing. So remember, we have those information theoretic quantities. They have a lot of good properties. And I'm going to focus on, the, on this notion of mutual information, which is essentially the entropy of X minus the entropy removed from X when I know Y. I'm sorry, entropy of X given Y, which is essentially how much uncertainty I lost, or again, I lost when I know Y about X. So this is going to be zero if X and Y are independent. OK, so I'm going to use mutual information all over the place. And I wanted to, and I need actually two properties of you just to remind you then. The first one is what we call data processing inequality, which means that if I have a Markov chain, X, Y, Z, and so on, information can only go down which means the information about the input, let's say, in every one of the layer can only decrease when I move uh, through this process of the multi-layer. And of course, also about the true, the desired label, since it's to the left of my chain, it's also going to go down. And uh, of course, uh, an immediate consequence of it is that information is completely invariant to one-to-one to -one transformations. So, so uh, this is actually a pain for all of you because you know I can encrypt my data, it will not change information at all, and it will, be, uh, it will be a pain for the network. So something is obviously missed about the dynamics, about the computational issues when I look at information values. I'm going to come back to that. But now, now, so now I'm actually, okay, so if I actually apply this chain of inequalities, let's somehow believe me that we actually know how to estimate information even for very large systems, although it's very difficult, but I don't really care. In principle, I have this chain of inequalities, so I have this, download inequality in terms of the information about the input and download and down, downward inequality, list of inequalities when I talk about information about the, the, the label. And this list of points I'm going to call the information path of the network. Okay, so notice that slightly different way of thinking about it is that each layer is actually characterized Maybe I should move a little bit. Uh, each layer is characterized by, by, uh, by what I call an encoder, which is essentially the stochastic map, or, or even deterministic, but in general, I think about the stochastic map from the input to the layer. How, wh what is actually encoded by this particular layer? And there is a decoder, which is how the output is decoded from this layer. Now, I can also think about the optimal decoder, which is if I had the representation of the layer, what would have been my best decoding, essentially predicting the true Y, and then I simply use the, the Markov chain to the left through X. Okay, so I'm going to talk mostly about the information of the encoder of the layer and the information of the optimal decoder of the layer. And essentially, I have this theorem. Some people ask me if it's a real theorem. I think it's a real theorem, but the proof is not so difficult, <laughs> not so simple. <laughs> this is something like a coding theorem. So essentially, I argue, and this is somewhat surprising, that when the, large, the problem gets large, such that I can talk only about, I can focus on typical patterns, so I can shovel under some epsilon all the non-typical things, uh, only two numbers really matter. So out of those millions of parameters, and all the weights, I mean, this seems like a very high dimensional problem. When you talk about large problems, it's only these two numbers, the information of the encoder, ixt, of each, of each layer, and the information of the optimal decoder, ITY, which are going to tell me the, the, the story I'm really interested in. And the story I'm interested in, or story everybody is interested in, is what is the optimal trade-off between sample size and accuracy. I mean, these are the two numbers you really care about. Nothing else matters. I mean, there's a lot of computational issues. How do you get to this accuracy? But in principle, in terms of sample information, what you call information complexity or sample complexity, these are the two things. What is, what is the number of examples you need for a certain accuracy or certain performance? 
And uh, I argue that these are the two things that asymptotically govern the picture. This is a huge reaction in complexity. I, I need to worry only about two numbers. Of course, there are many assumptions here. And the, the main assumption here is that both ixt and ity are in some sense uh, self-averaging, as we call it in physics, or, or concentrate nicely when the problem gets large. OK, so, so before, I, before I argue why this is true, I just want to show you this uh, very famous uh, movie by now. In the last year, it became very popular. So essentially, this is the information plan. It's a simulation of a small network. But I actually argue this is the typical picture you see in even large networks. And there are many, many people who tried it in the last year. And there are all sorts of people who agree with me more and less. But this is that basically agree that this is the type of picture you see. So what you see here is what I call the encoder information on the left, uh, on the FCSA, which is IXT. And uh, the decoder information, or the optimal decoder information on, 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 on the right, on and you see this is a very small problem. It has only 12 bits of entropy in the input, so it is 12 binary inputs. But, so it's very small. But that, then, I, then I can estimate everything exactly. I mean, both the information and the entropies and everything. And if, you see this is a one bit. It's a Boolean function. So the, the output information is bounded by one. And this is the initial condition, the initialization of a network, which means I, I actually I actually scatter the uh, 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 sample, the weights by a, a Gaussian distribution around zero. And that actually turns out to be important how you initialize the network. I'm not going to talk much about it. There's much to say about it. But most people, that's what they do. I mean, they initialize the weights with small random numbers around zero, small compared to the nonlinearity of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the units, which I assume in this case to be sigmoidal, but it can be values, or it can be any piecewise linear, including linear itself. It doesn't really matter. Now, what you see here is this very sharp drop in information. So the first hidden layer, I'm not going to, well, the first hidden layer, the blue one here, is, is, uh, is essentially not losing information about either input or output. Just some sort of scrambling. So that's why it's, it's at the top right here. But once you go through, through the layers with these random weights, especially in this particular network, which has some, some sort of an Eiffel Tower, so the, the layers get shrinked uh, in size, you see this very sharp drop of information. And the last hidden layer, which is really the important one, because that's where you're going to make your prediction, is this orange things down there, uh, which, which is uh, essentially no information about the input, very little, about one or two bits, and no information about the label. So this is a very use, it's a useless <laughs> layer at this point. And what you see here, those different uh, circles, in diff so each color is a different layer. And, uh, and uh, we repeated this with 100 in in random initial conditions and random set of examples. So everything, everything that I could randomize, we randomized. That's why you see this scatter. So when we actually uh, train the network, you're going to, we see this type of uh, movies <laughs> that we see all the time. And uh, so what you see here is the number of epochs which is essentially the number of cycles through the data. So the, the size of the data here was 3,000 patterns out of, out of the 4,096 and 92, and, uh, uh, 96. And, and, uh, and essentially, uh, um, so this is something like 80% uh, of the data. So this is well trained. I just want to focus your attention to several interesting questions. Just by looking at this movie, which I, I, I really very briefly try to explain. First of all, is this the general picture? I mean, this is really what we see in neural networks in general. I argue, yes, it is. Unless you tweak and do things that are not standard, you can, of course, force the layers to converge to the same points, or sometimes then force them to move to the left. But in general, we see something like this. First of all, this. this is, why do they concentrate? This is actually quite surprising. I mean, these are very different networks. They train on different examples that are trained on with the initialized differently, entirely differently in this space, or around zero. <laughs> but uh, so why do they look so similar after this randomized uh, epochs of training? So the concentration to me is a, it's a key. Uh, but so first of all, it means that these two numbers somehow seem to be invariant to many other things. I mean, you see the same, especially here in the last layer, very sharp concentration of these, of these uh, 100 uh, networks. The other layers is not so sharp, but I'm going to prove to you that it's going to get sharper and sharper the larger the network, or the larger the input. Now, uh, 
Uh, what do they mean? So, okay, so essentially the main theorem is that ITY completely dominates the what we call generalization error. Essentially, it's telling me how well you do outside of your training data, very precisely, and this uh, you can easily believe. What is le less obvious is that IXT is actually dominating the sample size. So this is some sort of dimensionality. It's not the VC dimension or anything like this. Actually, 2 to the i tx behaves a little bit like the dimension. It's exponential in 2, in, in this information. But you see that something quite strange happens here spontaneously. So you see that during the first phase of around 300 epochs of training, you increase the information about the label and a little bit move to the right, which means you also remember more the data in some sense. But from this point, 300 epochs more or less, all the way to the, the 10,000 epochs that we did here, uh, you, you go up, which means improving generalization, and to the left. At least, it seems that the last layer certainly goes to the left. Eventually, it remembers one bit about the input and one bit about the output, which is perfect. I mean, I remember exactly just the partition that I want and nothing else. So, you know, I can put a hyperplane there and separate my data perfectly. So you expect the last layer to remember only one bit about the input. But why all the other layers seem to be moving also to the left and how they do it and why, why does it happen in parallel? So in some sense, this is the picture that also got a little bit famous. So this is just the averages of, this, of, this, uh, of these clouds, which I'm allowed to average because they seem to concentrate very nicely. So between A and C, you seem to see some sort of fitting the data very well. I, I'll argue that this is essentially the initial phase of learning and then falling into some sort of a flat minimum, which many people report. And from C to E, this is really the big surprise, or at least to us it was a surprise, that most of the generalization improvement and most of the time of the training is spent on, on compressing the representation, on moving from C to E and then allow all the other layers, layer three, two, and all of them essentially slowly move to the left. So what I'm trying to understand, uh, first of all, the, the first part of theory here is really convincing you that, uh, that uh, it makes sense. I mean, so actually, the fact that this, that I'm actually reducing the, the information about the input is helping generalization. So here is just the gist of it uh, very, very quickly. Uh, essentially, uh, the old type of uh, puck-like bounds, which I hope most of you heard about or know, is that the generalization gap, which is essentially what I call the hair here, but essentially the, pro the, the difference between the training and the expect expected error is bounded, square of it is bounded by essentially two numbers, the log of the cover of the cardinal of, of, of the card of the log of the cardinality of an epsilon cover of your hypothesis class which is the the, ma the main trick of uh, of Vapnik if you want I mean so you take you take uh, essentially or, or in valiant later on I mean you take you take uh, essentially your class you you epsilon cover it or epsilon over two cover it and then you learn this finite cover uh, and, and 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 essentially you have a cardinality bound so it's the log of the cover the canal is covered divided by m, and if the cover scales like 1 over epsilon to the d, as we expect from finite dimensional uh, objects, uh, so this is the way we usually cover a finite dimensional, or what we call the topological dimension, then you get this nice d log over epsilon, long 1 over epsilon over m. So d over m is going to be this uh, dominant factor in learning. As long as the number of examples is, is smaller than d, you don't generalize. Once it gets larger than d, you begin to generalize, which means that the bound on epsilon become meaningful. This is the essence of learning theory today, with all sorts of variations on this theme. <laughs> now, uh, the, the, the problem is that it doesn't seem to give us anything useful for, for this type of deep learning. So again, we are very late, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. Essentially, my, my main idea was to move from the cover of the hypothesis class to a cover of the input, which means I'm going to partition my data instead of the hypothesis in a way which will allow us to move from all possible functions, in this case, let's say, to the, to the cardinality of x. If I just start, start with all possible Boolean functions on x and x is finite, 
2 to the cardinality of x is going to give me all the functions. Of course, if I plug this in, in this bound, I get nothing. I get what we call the no free lunch theorem. So it's x over m. You need essentially the, the same number of examples as, as, uh, as, as the cardinality of your data, which is not very useful. <laughs> but if I somehow manage to cover my input by, by cells, which are going to be eventually more and more homogeneous with respect to the label, somehow, then I, I move from the number of labels that I need will move from 2 to the x to 2 to the cardinality of the cover. Now, this looks like, okay, and, and there are also sorts of three quite how I can do this, but so let me again uh, go to the, 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 the main idea here and, and ask me if, if you don't understand what I'm doing. So first of all, I'm going to assume this, what we call typical patterns. So typical patterns in information theory are things where the one over n log of the probability of many, many, of many, many samples, in this case, the, let's say the pixels of the image, converge in the large limit to a number which we usually call the entropy, or the, enter the source entropy. So you're used to it maybe in communication where this is just a sequence in time, and then if I take a very long block, it's converging to the entropy. This is an old trick, and this is actually the most fundamental property of entropy, if you're asking me. Now, I can actually apply it also when we have patterns like images, and they're locally factorizable, which means it's some sort of a Markov random field, or you know, a graphical model with some, with some bounded degree, or, or something like this, where essentially I can write the probability of a, the pattern as a product over the probabilities of each pixel conditioned on some neighborhood. And if, if this neighborhood is not too large, and this probability is essentially fixed, I'm going to have this convergence in the limit, because the log is going to be a log of condition independent terms, and the central limit theorem applies, and everything is nice. This is the only crucial assumption that I'm making, that my patterns have this typicality factorization. Now, as you see here, I mean, if this is true, then under these assumptions, this is not a proof, this is just an intuition of the, of the, the proof, both the ixt and ity will concentrate. Because eventually it will look like a log of a product of a lot of independent terms, and for the, all the usual reasons, this will average nicely. And that's the main reason why we see this concentration in the plan. ITY, by the way, is a little more tricky because it's a log of a sum, but this sum is going to be dominated by one term eventually in the long and large and limit. This is precisely the same argument used in statistical mechanics all the time for partition functions. And eventually, this also look going to factorize or to be dominated by a fact, a fa one factor in this. So this is, this is the main reason why we see this very nice concentration for this type of pattern. By the way, my problem was not chosen that way. But if I can actually use this, uh, this, uh, this uh, typicality argument, not I can estimate from it the size of the typical patterns. Because once I restrict myself to typical patterns, the probability of a typical pattern is more or less 2 to the minus the entropy, and they're all equally likely, more or less. So the size is 1 over that. That's Shannon's uh, idea, it's not mine. <laughs> it's actually uh, very, so this is the log, the, the entropy is nothing but the log of the number of typical patterns. Okay, again, and not in the very new, it goes all the way to the 19th century. But I also assume that each of those partitions, and those partitions are the things that are induced by the neurons in the layers, so each, each layer is essentially some sort of a partition of my patterns, because there are many patterns mapped to the same values of the layer. So condition on the layer also assume typicality. That's a very big assumption. You have to be careful about it. So, so my layers have to be sufficiently coarse such that m enough patterns are mapped to the same value of each of the layers. And that's getting better and better when I move further away into the network because the partition is going to be coarser and coarser because of this Markov condition, because of the data processing inequality, essentially. So I assume that both of these things are, are true. That I, and there, if I assume that, I can actually assume, I can calculate or estimate the cardinality of this epsilon, of this uh, compressed uh, compressed representation. So essentially, the the total number of typical patterns exponential in the entropy. I suppressed n here just uh, for simplicity, and and the the size, the average size of each of these cells that are induced by the layers is exponential in the conditional entropy, and therefore the size of the partition, T epsilon, is precisely 2 to the i. 
not precisely, asymptotically due to the hx minus hx given t. So this again, anybody who saw Shannon's theorems uh, should uh, remember this argument. This is precisely the, the, key, ar the, p the key argument in both channel coding and, and ray distortion theory. Essentially, I'm covering, I'm looking for the optimal cover of my input such that I get this bound on the cardinality. But here comes a, a big surprise. I mean, so if this is the, the, a, a, an estimate of the typical cardinality of my cover, then just plugging it back there, and this is essentially something which is a big no-no in, 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 in learning theory, because you're not supposed to put something which was, a, which was generated by the training as your hypothesis class. This is, this is, this is, this is something which is usually a, a prescription for overfitting, but uh, but uh, we can do it here. I mean, we can control these things. Actually, the work of Ohad a little bit helped us with this. I mean, it's a long time. So this is essentially the same type of argument, uh, some sort of uniform convergence of uh, empirical convergence argument that you can use in a much cleaner way to get the same bound. And it's 2 to the i when I plug it, which is t. So 2 to the t is 2 to the 2 to the i. It's a double exponent. And when I plug this double exponent in the log there, I get this type of very surprising a generalization gap bound, which is the error, the difference between the training error and generalization error is bounded by two to the mutual information of the compression divided by the number of examples. Now this sounds crazy, if, I mean, if I have a million examples, so the l it's, it's only when i is smaller than log of m where these things make any sense, which means that uh, log of m is very small. I mean, okay, so I need 20 labels here. Uh, 20 labels, and so why does it make sense? Because we know that indeed the minimal number of labels that you need in a random, in randomly selected inputs, is which is what sometimes we call it the query complexity of the problem. So how many labels, if, if I can choose them carefully, I really need is really logarithmic. It's not more than logarithmic. This is the number of real labels which will eventually generate. So this i is precisely the query complexity. So that's why it makes sense. But notice that now we are talking about a completely different mechanism. The network is really compressing the representation and reducing this i. And if indeed the last hidden layer gets to very low i, I will generalize well. The question is how much I will pay in terms of information about y. Okay, so this very simple bound tells us something interesting. So I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is another way of thinking about, about this bound, but essentially, there is always, for so far, I completely ignore the fact that I don't see all the data, Th that there is actually a, s a sample. And uh, this is, of course, a big issue I mean, <laughs> in learning theory. I, so I can't really estimate this through i's because I don't have the joint distribution of x and y. What I have is only a sample of the joint distribution of x and y. So the question is how well I can estimate this value of information, how well I generalize if I actually do the same the same type of uh, dynamics uh, using uh, a sample. So this is again a work that goes all the way to 2008 with uh, Shamir and uh, Ohad Shamir and, and, uh, and Sivan Sabato, uh, which are es essentially calculating this red curve. Now this red curve tell me if you, so okay, so, so, th so the, the, there's an issue I, I skipped uh, immediately. So, so first of all, before I, I talk about bounds here, you should ask yourself, okay, so if everything happens in this plan, and I really want to go up and left as much as I can, is there, is there a bound that I cannot cross? And the answer is yes. There is this black wall, which is what we call the information bottleneck limit, which is essentially the maximum information about y that you can get at a certain information about x, or the minimum information about x that you can get at a certain information about y. This I can surprisingly calculate just from the joint distribution of x and y, just in principle. So this black limit is exaggerated here. Usually it, it can be a lot, a lot closer to the top, but it's always there. I mean, this is the best you can do with any algorithm. So our brain or any alien's brain cannot do better than this black line. This is a property of the problem. It's not a property of the algorithm. It's again something that uh, computer scientists hate, but there are things like this. So uh, it's algorithm independent bound. <laughs> bound. And, <coughs> and what you see is that if you don't have enough data, you may think 
that you actually on the red, on the black curve, this is the empirical, empirical information, but the actual information is the red curve. Which means that if you are in a very detailed representation, very small compression, you lose a lot. Because most of those cells are going to be empty, there are no labels there, and you're going to make very poor predictions on them. In order to actually make good prediction, you need to coarsen your partition, or, uh, or something, uh, coarsen your, your uh, in other words, compress your representations, and eventually get to this maximum of the red curve, this area, and this is the best you can do. And th again, this picture is a bit exaggerated in purpose just to make, to make the point. So in general, I'm going to lose two types of things. I'm going to lose, due to the compression, to what I call the compression less, loss, which is the best I could do if I had all the data. And then I'm going to lose more because of the some finite sample. And I want to minimize both of them. OK, so we see already just from this analysis that there is a <laughs> strong incentive in some a strong reason for the network to move to the left. Because you want to be in the, in the, in, in the, in the region, region of the maximum of the red curve and not the uh, not, uh, maximum of the black curve, which is essentially don't compress at all. OK. There are many, many other details on this, in this picture which I don't, I'm not going to discuss today. Just want to show you indeed what happens with finite data. So uh, these are, these are our, our way of depicting, and a lot of people are using it now. I, I'm really, I was amused to see both at MIPS and at uh, iClear today how many are using our software to generate these pictures. <laughs> but it's all right. So, so uh, the color here is, uh, is uh, from black, zero, with the number of epochs all the way to 10,000 epochs, yellow. And uh, the, those traces are, are colored by the, by the number of epochs, and so you see the dynamics. And you see again, this is with 80%, what you saw before, 80% of the samples, and this there is with the 5% of the samples, which is clearly under-trained. And what you see that the first phase, I mean, going, reaching this flat minima, or you don't know yet that it's flat minima, but I know, so uh, uh, this, uh, reaching this green line is actually very common, even if you have very, li very, very little data. It's only this second phase, what I call the compression phase, this very long, very long process of moving to the left and, and up, which is completely destroyed where you don't have enough data. And you see that with 5%, you actually do, do something which we may call overfitting. You actually compress too much, and you don't, ha you don't have enough labels so are guaranteed that the cells are pure in terms of the label, and therefore you don't predict well. So we be now, now we have a actually very good understanding of those limits. You see this very nice uh, curve that the layers converge to, even in, with a finite sample, and it turned out to be, again, asymptotically only a property of the problem and the sample size, and not the architecture, which is, again, very surprising. I mean, so essentially all the architecture uh, properties, uh, as, long as, as long as it's, uh, of course, the number of layers and, and, and the way they behave in the plan depend very much on the architecture, but the limit, this limiting line depends essentially only on the problem and sample size. So that's very nice, because now we have a, a theory, a, a, a really finite sample, uh, theory for a lot of different uh, architectures with the same problem. So it's really the dream. I mean, <laughs> in some sense, we don't need to worry about the architecture. So okay, I have so a question. Yes. So does it imply that uh, when you train, you should initially use uh, a large number of epochs with very little data until you reach this uh, that's right. line, that's and right. only <laughs> later on add the additional data? You're absolutely right. That's, that's one of the ideas. And, and, and actually, uh, well, you know, and yeah, 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 and you're absolutely right. Okay. So, I, I, yeah, yeah, like always, I mean, you have the right intuition. I just want to give you the basic reason why these things happen. So, if you actually look at this, oh, I'm sorry about the, the fonts there. If you actually look at, at, the num at the same movie again of the what I call the information plan, together with the training error, or actually generalization error, it doesn't really matter in this case, you see that this point where it starts to move left of this uh, start to compress is precisely the knee of this error. I mean, where the error essentially flattens. So the gradients are very small. All the gradients in all the layers are very small in magnitude. So this gave us uh, immediately the, the intuition that something strange happens to the gradients at this point. And indeed, this is a picture which is not precisely accurate, but it's good enough for us. <laughs> so uh, what you see here, this is really the key to the whole, the whole riddle. I mean, uh, 
What you see here in a log-log plot, again in number of epochs, is the standard, the, the mean, the absolute value mean of the gradient per weight, and the standard deviation of, and the standard deviation is calculated over the mini batches. I mean, over the, the, the fact that I actually cut my data into a lot of pieces, so I had something like 20 or more pieces of gradients, which are noisy gradients at every point. And this is the standard deviation with respect to these mini batches. And this is the architecture that we use all the time, but we actually have many, many different, just to give you the idea. And you see in different colors for each layer, the mean and the standard deviation. And you see that at the beginning, the gradients are very clean. It's about 200 of magnitude, 200 order of magnitude decimal order of magnitude uh, signal-to-noise ratio, which is really very nice. So it's 20 dBs, and, uh, or whatever. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and once you get to this point of 300 epochs, you get this very big change. The mean of the gradient goes down and actually disperses in a very interesting way. And, and the standard deviation actually goes up. And actually, most of these, uh, between 300 and 9,000 in this case, the signal-to-noise ratio of the gradients is very low. It's about uh, minus 10 dBs, <laughs> okay, if you're an engineer. Okay. So, so this is interesting. Something very different in terms of the dynamic of the training happens before this point and after this point. Actually, I mean, what physicists usually do is they plot the norm of the weights itself. So if you see this is the norm, there are no re there's no regularization here, there's no weight decay, there are all those tricks I suppressed, so it's in they simply grow. So if indeed I'm right that during this noisy phase of the gradients, you're actually doing a random walk, some sort of diffusion, then the weight should grow linearly more or less up to this point because this is pure drift. I mean, you just add gradients, and that's indeed what we see. And you see that from this point, from this red line, the slope of the curve in a log log plot looks much smaller than one. It's actually even smaller than half, but more or less it, it, it behaves like dominated by square root of t, which is exactly what you expect from a diffusion process. Diffusion, random walk, and the distance grows like square root of t, more or less, or, or lower. So that's a very nice independent uh, verification that there are indeed two different behaviors to the, to the, gra the gradient behave. So, okay, so thi and this is true for all networks that we checked and all layers, and, and I don't have time to really show you the, but uh, I just want to, the punchline of the story, and this is com a completely new result, is that uh, this, this explains this prediction that we had a year ago that when you add layers to the network, you see it in this picture, this is with one layer, one hidden layer, you see that you don't get to very high uh, prediction. It's, it takes forever in the red to really get high enough. And the same problem in terms of six layers, you see it's all, it's all in the dark blue or dark, dark, dark purple, which means that very quickly you get to this. Uh, so the question, and, 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 and how, why it happens and how it happens. Actually, this is just to, to convince you this is really true. What you see here is the number of iterations, I mean, number of updates, not epochs, no, never mind, number of updates uh, that it takes to reach a certain 9.98% bit in this case, which is very high in generalization in our case, but in the last hidden layer, uh, as a function of uh, the number of layers. I, I predicted it's going to be a power law, and I was really amazed to see how nice it is a power law. So the question, okay, so this really looks very, very dramatic. I mean, you increase the number of layers, and you converge dramatically faster. What, what can explain? Nobody said it before, as far as I know, by the way. Although people observed it, but nobody really predicted it. I mean, so something very bizarre happens here. Most of the benefit of adding many layers is computational. I mean, you really... Improve the time of convergence by adding layers. So since I'm, I'm having only two minutes, I'm taking it seriously. Uh, I, I just want to show you why it happens in one in one slide or in two slides. Okay. So essentially, the uh, the story I told you so far is that the weights accumulated, these accumulated gradients happened in two steps. The first step is what I call here WCCA. K is the index of the layer. It's this falling into the flat minima. This is very nice. You're in the right region. And from there on, we get this delta W, which is this random walk. Now, this random walk eventually looks like, in high dimension, like noise, because it's an integrated uh, uh, noise. 
which eventually accumulated by like a Gaussian or like a Wiener process. So each, each weight gets essentially noise as a part of the component of the weight. And this noise or this uh, uh, diffusion process has a very non-uniform uh, covariance matrix. It is very wide in what we call the irrelevant dimensions of the data, which are most of the dimensions. <laughs> I mean, all those changes in the weights which are not going to affect my error. So if I do face recognition, there are maybe 20 dimensions which are really important. I mean, the, the size of the, my nose and so on. <laughs> but, and, and there are many, many things, especially in the background and the whatever, the illumination and so many, many, many other things in the, in the image which are irrelevant. Essentially, all the dimensions of changes which are not affecting the error are those irrelevant dimensions, which means that those are precisely the dimension where you are going to diffuse very quickly. You're not protected. Nothing is going to stop you. So the noise is going to grow in these irrelevant dimensions like square root of t more or less, uh, or some, some power. So now before I do this estimation correctly, you just see that this immediately tells me that I can bound the mutual information between two consecutive layers by this Gaussian bound of, on the information, which is the log of one of the signal-to-noise ratio. And this already tells me, look for any nonlinearity. The nonlinearity here is sigma. So you see the, the map between one layer to the next, essentially a nonlinearity of a linear function. A non the linear function itself already behaves like a Gaussian channel, which, and which where the noise is growing in all the irrelevant dimensions. So that's very nice. First of all, it gives me a bound on the error, which we can actually estimate very, very, very accurately. I'm not going to go through it. But eventually, it tells me that the information between the layers, this formula, is going to behave like a constant plus something which goes like a negative power of time which is this decay of the signal-to-noise ratio due to the diffusion. I'm sure that Ali got it. I'm not sure about everybody else, but never mind. So, uh, <laughs> so essentially, uh, this tells you, and then we can actually really rigorize and prove very carefully everything I said here, because of this power law increase in, in, the, in, the, in the diffusion of the irrelevant weights, and the ratio, the ratio between them is going to decrease, essentially I'm going to decrease the signal-to-noise ratio and therefore compress because I'm losing information. And that's the, the basic prediction of this analysis, <laughs> that the time that it takes to converge to a different a certain level go, goes like the number of, with k layers, go, goes like the number of layers to minus one over the diffusion constant uh, times the time that it takes to converge with one layer. Now, this exponent depends strongly on the assumption, which is usually wrong, that each layer is compressing a different, different part of the space. Usually it's not true. Okay, so now we started to really look at a lot of, a lot of layers. So you see here you really get this nice, uh, uh, almost exponent is almost one half. 0 0.55, which means the inefficiency due to this non, due to the non-overlap of the, of the layers, they, do, they don't compress the same information, it's very small, but then we looked at the real problem. This is NIPS, a NIST. I mean, one of those uh, character recognition problems. And we saw again a very nice power law as a function of the number of layers, but the exponent was 1.2. That means that in NIST, at least, this assumption of the fact that the layers compress different parts of information is, is completely wrong. There's actually essentially one third or two third overlap between them, which explains the ratio between uh, 1.2 and, and, and 0 0.4 or something, which is what we actually saw in the diffusion. By the way, this is how the, the, the weights look as a function of time. You see, again, this very nice change of slope. This is a log-log plot. So, so this diffusion assumption is actually very good, even for NIST. But the, the assumption that the layers uh, compress independently is wrong. So this gives us a, a new parameter, which essentially is the cosine of the angle between the subspaces that each layer each layer compressed, and we started to estimate it and actually have some sort of theory. And one of the things we can say now, that if there is symmetry in the problem, for example, uh, there's a transformation that rotates the patterns and doesn't change the label. So if there's a very simple symmetry in the problem, like which is the case in our, in our symmetric, what we call the symmetric problem, everything is invariant to rotations in three dimensions. And I, I don't want to get into too much group theory now, this is something I do with physicists. But essentially, if there is a symmetry, this assumption of separation of the ang uh, uh, angle close to 90 degrees is actually very good. If there is no symmetry or a weaker symmetry, this, the, this angle gets uh, lower and lower. And, and I think I'm out of time, so uh, I'm just... Uh,
more or less going to summarize. Yeah. Okay, so I know usually I, I have to say something about the reservations and criticism, but you can read them yourself. yourself. Uh, there are a lot of them. But uh, so the, uh, most of the criticism of this work, by the way, is due to uh, uh, misconceptions about the way we use information. Because we discretize things and we, we it's, it's a whether it's really information or not information, but never mind. So, so essentially what we said, there, there are two main mathematical results. First one, what I call the information plan theorem, which tells you, look, for large enough problems, it's only the mutual information of the, of the, the encoder and the optimal decoder which tell you the story about generalization accuracy. This by, by itself is interesting. And then there's all these dynamic issues. We tell you, look, the, the reason neural network works so well is because stochastic gradient descent is spending most of the time on diffusion, which looks like a stupid thing to do, but this diffusion is actually compressing the representation and therefore improving the generalization. And therefore, don't try to get rid of it. If you stop too early without the diffusion, you're not generalized very well. By the way, this is one of the reasons that uh, a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal stories that, that uh, people keep on training after the training error looks like zero for many, many cycles, and they improve the performance. And the reason they improve the performance is precisely this suppression of the, the, no, of the irrelevant details, which is really the most important part of the thing, problem. Think about the face recognition. There are so many irrelevant details. Nobody is telling me that the background is irrelevant, or the illumination is irrelevant, or my hat is irrelevant, and so on. This is something that the network has to learn. And it learns it only by the fluctuation between one picture to another picture with the same label. And that's precisely why this generates noise in the gradients. That's precisely why this diffusion is so informative, actually. It's sec some sort of a second order learning, which is not in the label itself, it's in the differences between pictures with the same label. Anyway, I, I think I'll stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Yes. So when you talked about the relationship uh, 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 between uh, the network's behavior and the number of layers, everything seemed to be monotonic, and uh, you said that uh, the larger the number of layers, the better it's going yeah, to be. Yeah, okay, so that there's, a there's essentially some sort of a, a point of, of vanishing returns, as, as we said. I mean, so but is it a point of vanishing return, or is it a point where you start losing because if you have uh, a trillion layers, then uh, the number of parameters becomes very large and uh, it becomes much uh, harder to train. So, sure. so, so can you get from your theory a, a number which is the optimal number of layers? Okay, very, very good. I mean, I could expect this uh, question for you. So essentially, even with this exponent that we see in MNIST, one of 1.2, it's already... Uh, losing compared to the linear growth in compu computation that you have just by adding layers. So it's actually not just counting the number of iterations, but the number of total computations, you're not gaining. You are right, you are beginning to lose. Although with the one half, it's a quadratic enhancement, and this will, with this will carry out quite far. The second effect is that when you add more layers, many of those layers become degenerate in my plan. They're going to fall one on top of the other. Which means that I don't know what happens within the information you don't lose. It may be actually decrypting something, who knows? <laughs> Breaking a code or something, something similar. Like, but it's not something which I see in the information plan. And these things happen more and more. Actually, in the complete theory, we know that they have symmetry in the problem. Those layers are going to depend on the number of irreducible components or irreducible, irreducible representations of my symmetry group and so many other things like this, which eventually are going to tell me each layer is going to converge to something very specific, which I can really predict. This is going to ask these questions about the data, and this is going to ask the different questions. Eventually, you, you end up the, the, you end up with this is a finite number if you have a representation, a symmetry group indeed. So, so there is an optimal number of layers. No, but it sounds to me that regardless of whether the uh, exponent was 1.2 or yeah. 0.5, you're still gaining. Better. In uh, one case, uh, you should add as many layers as possible as you can, and in the other case, you uh, you're losing. That's but right. there is no uh, kind of Initially, it is beneficial, and then you start losing. Uh, I didn't see the transition point where uh, you can estimate what is the optimal number of layers coding to. So first of all, the whole thing is still uh, in, in progress, <laughs> still in investigation. I mean, we haven't finished it, but 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 it's only very partly published, by the way. But it's it's uh, it's. Uh, 
it's, you're right. I mean, it seems to be a very simple power law. It's a very simple power law. It doesn't have too much structure. I mean, where, where should I put the knee? Uh, or the, but but uh, this power law is really competing with computation. Now, in, in our case, for example, not all, that, all the layers have the same number of, of weights. So, the same, uh, so the, it's a much more delicate question already. And if I really take into account the structure, the architecture, the, the convolutions or things like this, may, this may change the game and so on. But in principle, just this very basic thing, adding more layers, <laughs> get less iterations, is, I think is always true. Yes? Um, at the beginning, you said that uh, one of the things that um, neural networks do is uh, cluster the sample space yes. um, and learn the, the learn the labels on the clustered representation. That's right. So um, again, just to clarify it, I mean, you, if you think about think about uh, hyperplanes, just rigid hyperplanes for a second. So so each neuron in in the K layer is actually a partition of your. So some patterns are mapped to one cell and some to the other. So that's yeah. actually what I mean. So um, if that is true, can <coughs> you um, imagine a different uh, algorithm to sort of perform this uh, this kind of uh, this optimization clustering. of clustering that is di uh, totally different than neural networks? And yeah, of course I can. Some sort of a nearest neighbors or, or you know, a Voronoi partitioning of your space and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, and this looks like very much like nearest neighbors uh, in, in high dimension. And nearest neighbors in high dimension are notoriously bad. So something, something has to compensate for it. And indeed, it's, it's really the local structure. So you know that, the, and I could show you some nice movies, uh, but I don't have time, that really ex explain why the, the local structure is actually low dimensional. It's only the global structure which is convoluted. And so it's really a, a low dimensional manifold, which is uh, folded in a very high dimension. And as long as the local, structure, the local dimensionality is small and, you, and your nearest neighbors are within this neighborhood, then nearest neighbors actually work so nicely. Now, now, there's another argument. I mean, those neurons actually put hyperplanes. So, because that's the, what they do. And it turns out also to be useful because hyperplanes essentially perform optimal type of Hypothesis testing, if you want, asking whether I belong to this category or this category optimally just because I have this log likelihood ratios which I'm calculating when I do hypothesis testing. So, so essentially, it turns, and that this I can also predict. I mean, I, we can actually predict exactly which type of, hype of binary questions are asked, in some sense, uh, by the layer about the data in the previous layer representation. And that's something which I don't know how to generalize to a more general uh, neighborhood. But so there is some conspiracy also in the choice of the hyperplanes, which plays a role in this theory, but next time.